we good? I think we're good. Hey dudes, and welcome back to The Vance. As always, I am your host, The Vance. And here we are once again well into our weekends. It is, of course, another Saturday. And hopefully to go along with how good your weekend is going, it is time for our second and final what's happening in fashion for the week so let's just get right into it and just a quick shout out before we roll into things today for all of you toy fans out there i did upload our second designer toy tuesday earlier this week so if you're interested in seeing that along with this video i will link that in the description down below but now with all that said let's move on to our headline for the day and in our headline of the day world-renowned designer martin margella sort of came back into the limelight for a little bit and he had some fairly interesting things to say as well so let's talk about it but of course first let's go over some of the basics designer martin margella first started his eponymous brand maison martin margella back in 1988 with the help of jenny mirins and god rest her soul and as a quick side note, if you do want to learn a little bit more about the Margella brand while he was there, and especially more in its early years, before the documentary comes out, I highly recommend reading some of Jenny's more recent interviews before she passed away. Some very insightful stuff in there from literally one of the co-creators of this brand. Martin ended up staying with his fashion house for 20 years, leaving the company back in 2008. And during the time he was there, and even after, after this time, up until now really, he has always really remained out of the limelight, with even only a few surviving photos of him existing, this one obviously being probably the most prevalent. And ever since his departure back in 2008, there's really only been one time that he's ever shown back up in the fashion news, and that was back in 2014 when John Galliano took over the reins of creative director at Maison Margiela. The reason being is because the two designers actually met for a day and talked about shared interests as well as what the kind of idea was for the company going forward. And if you are interested in learning a little bit more about this meeting of the two minds or a little bit more about Galliano taking over the fashion house, I highly recommend the interview he had during this time, which I will also link in the description down below. But if there is just one thing you could take away from this interview if you don't want to read it, it's that Galliano describes Margella as cool with every last fiber in his body. So yeah, seems like an interesting guy. But this now all leads up to two weeks ago during the Belgian Fashion Awards when Martin Margella won the jury prize and showed up once again. Well, kind of. You see, rather than showing up in person, instead he sent a letter which was read off at the fashion award show, which makes a lot more sense in terms of his character. Because if he had shown up in person, believe me, you would have known about it because the entire fashion world would have collectively shat a brick. And in this letter, he talks about many different things, the first of which being just him reminiscing about receiving his first award that many years ago, then moving on into why he decided to leave the fashion industry, and it was kind of broken down into two major ideas, the first of which being the continual growth of fashion, which of course led to the continual growth of trade, and it was all becoming just a little bit too much for him. And then the second and much more major reason being just the growth of info that came from social media alone and how that really affected the thrill of the wait in between seasons as well as the element of surprise in those seasons as well which he considered very fundamental to his brand which was slowly waning and as you can see now is pretty much gone nowadays and although all these things that he brought up in this letter are so somewhat interesting, by far and above the most interesting thing he said was saved for last, and let me just read it off for you here. And he says, and I quote, but today I am happy to notice again a growing interest for creativity and fashion by some upcoming designers, and I'm sure you're all wondering, who are they? Did he name these designers? Of course not. What else would Margella be if not cryptic? 
This is the epitome of just everything that surrounds him. But now, of course, this leads to a lot of interesting questions as well as speculation. I mean, there are so many brands out there nowadays, more than ever before, across such a wide spectrum of genres and styles. And obviously, Martin hasn't really gone anywhere as far as his love for fashion goes, so there could be a whole just myriad of designers he sees out there that he finds interesting from all corners of the globe and the industry. It also makes you wonder if when he says there's a growing interest for creativity in fashion, if he's talking about people or brands in general, or if he's talking about himself and maybe his desire to come back, which would be just insane. But with all that now out in the open, what do you guys feel about this? Has this piqued your interest at all? Would you be interested in seeing Margiela come back to fashion? Or even if that isn't in your realms of possibility, what brands do you think he's referring to? Or what designers has he been looking at? Do you have a list that you think is that interesting? Or that you think that Margiela would find interesting? Let me know what you guys think. I'd love to see what brands you think would pique the interest of Margiela because if they'd be interesting to him, I'd love to know what they are. But now, of course, with our headline done, let's move on to our art stories for the day. And first up, Felipe Pantone is back yet once again, showing off some of his new works from his recent showing in New York City. And I mean, even for as kind of repetitive as these pieces have gotten, they're still super interesting to me. Plus, we got to see the inclusion of some more of his kind of super hued, very reminiscent of a color wheel style paintings. And it's nice to see him take his ideas and kind of push them elsewhere. Yes, this isn't a new idea to him, but the fact that we're seeing more of it is very interesting. So if you're interested in seeing any of these new works, I'd definitely check out this. Then renowned graffiti artist Seleka Munoz showed off some of his new more fine artwork and I just love this stuff. I always love a very nice use of color mixed with different styles and strokes and overall just a nice variety of work here. If you are a fan of abstract art, this is a definitely must look. And lastly, artist Emilio Cavallini and Miguru Yamaguchi just showed off some of their newest works from their recently closed exhibit and I just love these both for completely different reasons. Obviously with the former we see just a nice use of different materials, in this case different types of yarn, turned into some really abstract, really just fully patterned pieces that are very interesting and creative. And on Yamaguchi's side we see these very bold and bright works of art, very reminiscent of the kind of calligraphy style approach he's been taking in his brush strokes here. And overall, just a very wonderful exhibit from these two artists. And if you want to see more from either, I'd definitely check this out as well. All right, and now moving back into our fashion section for the day. First up, a brand feeling pieces showed off their fall winter 2018 collection, which also happens to be their first apparel collection. And I think for a first collection, it's fairly interesting. And I know what you guys are thinking. Feeling pieces? That's not a new company. I've definitely heard that name before. And you'd be right in saying that. Feeling Pieces has actually existed since 2009, having existed solely as a shoe company. Some of you might recognize this silhouette as it's mostly what they're known for. But now what we see here is a full-blown contemporary collection of apparel with some technical elements mixed in here and there to go alongside their shoes and once again, I think it's pretty interesting. What we have here is a variety of different pieces, albeit most of which seem to be outerwear, with a nice amount of details here and there, some very nice aesthetics as well, and some nice use of color pop in some of the pieces too. Do I think everything here is perfect? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. But still, for a first showing as a company with this amount of skill involved, it's 
very good for what it is. And one thing I really do want to highlight about this collection is just how cohesive it seems to fit in with their shoes, with their bread and butter, so to speak. Their more toned down contemporary pieces really do feel like they fit in nicely with that silhouette of the sneaker I showed you earlier. And on the flip side, their more technical pieces definitely seem to fit and work really well with their more athletic selection of shoes. And I really do have to once again commend them for being able to do this, seeing as how many other companies, specifically apparel companies, go out there and try and make their own brand of sneakers that aren't cohesive at all and usually just end up looking like shit. Yes, I'm specifically looking at you, Jerry. You know your shoes look like shit. But even with all of that now said, there is one huge major flaw in this collection and that is the price. Yes, I understand that their shoes are already a little bit more on the expensive side. Although realistically not that much more expensive than any Nike or Adidas collaboration you'd be finding nowadays. But unlike those two companies, Filling Pieces Apparel starts at $110, and that's just for a t-shirt. Beyond that, their pants start in the around 220 range, and that's just for the cheapest pairs. Some even go into the three and four hundred dollar range. And don't get me started on the tops, which can even go double on top of that. So all in all, for as decent as this collection is, especially for a starting collection, it still, yes, is a little bit rough around the edges in some of its designs, but really, unless they can bring that cost down, I personally don't think it has a foothold, no pun intended, in this style. Then on the flip side, Mr. P, which is of course Mr. Porter's in-house brand, showed off their first footwear collection, and Albeit a little rough around the edges, I think overall it's pretty nice. So as some of you may know, retailer Mr. Porter has been making their own brand, Mr. P, for a couple seasons now, and overall I think it's fairly well done. It definitely has a much more classic menswear vibe to it, which of course is exactly what they're going for. And even though it's a little bit more on the pricey side, for what it is and how it's made, it's pretty worth it in my opinion. And going along with everything I just said, it seems like they took all those ideas and threw them straight into their footwear collection here. We see a wide variety of different classic styles here, be it many different types of derbies and loafers and even boots to go along with these. They also showed off a few different types of sneakers in their lookbooks, but I can't find them anywhere on their site, which really only leads to two possibilities. One being that they are sold out completely on their sneakers already and if that's the case congrats or two something went wrong along the production lines of the sneakers and they had to pull them which in that case I'm sorry <laughs> But going back now to what's actually available, everything here seems like once again it's made with the highest quality possible. The materials range from your full grain leathers to your suede, and all the shoes here are also made in Italy as well. But I do have two minor gripes about some of these shoes. The first of which being the soles, the outsoles on some of these shoes, which just feel a little bit mismatched on some of the styles. And and end up kind of resulting in this clunky feel. And the second being that some of the heels on these shoes just seem really excessively high. Yes, I understand some of these more classic styles do have some large heels on them, but this almost feels like something that Robert Downey Jr. would wear, like that fucking high. So just as I said with the previous collection, it's a nice start, but if they can just refine it a little bit more, I do think it'll end up turning out to be something really excellent. And then Chinatown Market showed off their art school graphic tees, and I actually kind of enjoy them. The designs themselves range anywhere from a little bit interesting and funny to just kind of 
meh for me. But I do have to say it's very nice to see Chinatown Market here doing something that feels a little bit more nostalgic for them, a little bit more tongue-in-cheek, a little bit more funny, and for that I do have to give them somewhat of a credit. Also, I wouldn't be surprised to see Chinatown getting either sued over this or getting a cease and desist, but either way, that's probably a story for another time. And lastly, let's talk about the newest Montclair Genius collaboration, that being the Montclair 1952 Fall Winter 2018 collection. Having seen a just plethora of very interesting and creative collaborations up till now, it's kind of surprising for me to say, but it's really refreshing to see Montclair kind of tone it down and normalize it in this collection here. Like the Craig Green collection we talked about recently, it's sold out. Like, who the fuck is wearing that shit? Really, what we see in this collection here is two very specific styles coming through in Montclair pieces. That being this kind of 90s revival style, which we see a lot in the very use of bold colors and all over prints. And even in just the puffiness of these pieces, which yes, I understand Montclair is known for, more so in their jackets though, but we also see puffy vests here too. And then we also see kind of this very outdoorsy style kind of represented in once again those bold colors but really kind of in a more toned down way mixed along with some very kind of naturey patterns and motifs in some of these pieces here and overall I really don't think it's a bad collection I think there's a very nice use of patterns and colors in the pieces here obviously Montclair's quality is there so there's no reason to complain about anything on that end the only really odd thing about this collection is that it's probably by far, aside from that one poncho that really doesn't make sense in this collection, the least interesting Montclair collection so far. But it also happens to be the most easily wearable one, so that's kind of the trade-off here. And even though, yes, I do think that Fujiwara's collection was more interesting than this collection, I do think that overall this is still a much better collection than that. So if you have been kind of looking to dive into the Montclair Genius collection, or looking for something a little bit more toned down, definitely check out this collection, it will be right up your alley. And finally, let's move on to our articles for the day. And first of Dye Work, where I put out another amazing post, which they call menswear's last big moment, but what they kind of mean is what they consider the moment that led to the death of menswear, specifically more classic menswear. They talk about how this kind of style has really kind of just been thrown into the abyss over the last couple years as more kind of niche markets and ironic markets and streetwear has kind of taken hold of the industry as well as how there are certain things plaguing the industry as well such as these very kind of over-the-top minimalistic companies that are just popping up everywhere nowadays alongside a lot of those subscription companies as well and then they just kind of talk about why that classic men's style was so important and integral and very refreshing and why it needs a revival once again Dive Workwear just does another amazing post here and definitely worth reading if you're a fan of all types of men's fashion then High Snobiety sat down for an interview with with fashion photographer Tommy Tan, kind of getting his take on the industry right now. A lot of the questions here have to do specifically with streetwear, but he also talks a little bit more about just kind of his interest in fashion as well and just what he likes to take photos of. So if you're a fan of just kind of seeing how the industry has evolved through a fashion photographer's eyes or just learning a little bit more about fashion photography, I would definitely give this a read. And lastly, High Snobiety also sat down for a very in-depth interview with CEO of Nike, Mark Parker, talking about kind of his history with the company, his influence with some of the products, and just kind of overall where Nike is now. And if you are a fan of Nike or sneaker culture, or any of that, this is a must, must read. Very interesting article if you're into that part of fashion. All right, and with that, we reached the end of our second and final What's Happening in Fashion for the Week. 
I hope you guys have enjoyed. And as always, if you want to check out any photos from lookbooks I wasn't able to include or read any of the articles I talked about today, I've linked everything in the description down below. And if you are new here, then welcome. We do these What's Happening in Fashion videos usually twice a week at the beginning and end of the week, plus another occasional video here or there. So if you're interested in seeing more, feel free to subscribe. Otherwise, if you just have any questions, comments, concerns, or even just want to talk fashion in general, feel free to hit me up in the comments. I'm always willing to talk fashion. And thank you all once again for watching these videos and supporting my content. I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. And as always, until next time.